Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another UK SPS seminar. Uh, today we have Sasha, uh, who is a senior lecturer in computer science at the University of Surrey. Uh, he was previously at Harry Watt and uh, uh, University of Dundee and the ETH Zurich. Uh, he received a PhD in number theory from Rutgers University in the US and worked as a postdoc at NGNU Norway, uh, CIM Barcelona and the University of uh, Luxembourg. Uh, his research has focused on cryptographic protocols, uh, digital identity management and authentication, uh, and the modeling and formal verification of security and privacy in, crit uh, in critical systems. Uh, today, he will talk about managing our online account uh, security. Uh, now, I pass the stage to you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen Yu. Um... Right, so indeed, uh, this this work also has been uh, running while I was at ETH and then in Dundee and at Harriet Watt. Uh, and moreover, this work was also done with people at uh, these institutes. Um, but I will mention the, the individual names uh, a bit later when, when I refer to the papers uh, that I'm talking about. All right, so yes, so I'll talk about managing our online uh, security. Uh, the, the motivation for this uh, work um, is essentially a, account insecurities that, uh, that we have um, seen in the media being reported, uh, where some recovery mechanisms of an account were abused uh, that people were surprised by. Um, I'll give some examples of this, and in fact, my running example will be one of the uh, early such, uh, such uh, account compromises. Um, and then I'll talk about, well, the formal modeling of, uh, of account security uh, with uh, the tool that we came up with, account access graphs. Uh, and then in the second half, I'll talk about a user study where we then use these access graphs to model uh, and analyze real users' uh, account ecosystems. And then I'll conclude essentially with that there is a need for an account ecosystem management tool. All right, so this is roughly what you can expect today. So let's start with the motivation. Um, so about what is this 2012 uh, uh, writer for um, Wired, Matt Honan, uh, published an article saying how he got epically hacked. Uh, what happened to him was was terrible he he had lots of data with sentimental value um that that was wiped out as a consequence of the hack but that was just collateral damage he also lost several uh, accounts but the reason all of this happened to him was that he had a very short twitter handle a three-letter twitter handle and that's what the attacker wanted um the attacker never hacked his passwords or anything the attacker just used publicly available information and then abused Amazon's and Apple's customer support procedures. And while there were flaws in these procedures, the, the particular thing that made the attack possible was that um, Amazon was revealing to any customer the last four digits of the customer's credit card number. So they wouldn't reveal the full uh, credit card number unless you um, started editing and again required a certain password. Uh, but they did reveal the last four digits uh, of a customer's credit card. And Apple, on the other side, used the very same four digits to authentic authenticate a customer if you called their support service. All right, so the combination of these two flaws uh, led to his hacking. Uh, I'll get into the details. So this will be my running example today. So at the end, uh, if anything, you will understand how Matt Honan got hacked. But this was not the only uh, such attack. So such attacks kept happening uh, for, for a while now. So in the, the most recent such attacks are, uh, of course, related to, to people losing Bitcoin um, because, say, their Coinbase uh, account gets hacked. Um, but there were other high-profile attacks, such as uh, um, Jack Dorsey's Twitter uh, account being, uh, being hacked because of a SIM, swap, sorry, SIM swapping uh, uh, attack. So this is an attack where the attackers manage um, to convince the phone service provider that, that they have lost uh, their SIM, which is not their SIM, it's your SIM, 
um, and then get issued uh, a new SIM uh, card for a phone number that's not theirs. And then they essentially get uh, all the text messages onto that phone, onto their phone rather than your phone. Um, so it's it's a related type of attack. So again, uh, sharing with uh, with Honan's uh, problem is that uh, it is a recovery method that the attacker abuses to get control over some account that belongs to you. Um, right. So seeing all of these uh, issues, uh, what what makes us realize is that well, the security of our accounts with one service provider not only depends on our own security and the service provider's direct security measures. But it also depends on other security providers, on other accounts that we have, other apps that we have, devices, and all of their security. And finally, also how all of these things are connected to each other, in particular, how they are, say, connected to this one account uh, whose security we're interested in. So this is the problem we're facing. Now, be before I sort of formulate my research problem, which is, of course, you know, how do we keep all of our accounts secure? Uh, let me quickly define the term account ecosystem. So I refer to an account ecosystem as all of our accounts, all of our credentials, apps, devices, their connections. Okay. So instead of having to repeat, you know, accounts, credentials, apps, devices, and their connections, I will just call this our account ecosystem. All right. So the problem that I'm trying to address or that we try to address uh, in collaboration with many others um, is how do we assess the security of our account ecosystem? Okay. So again, here's the same uh, problem that I stated earlier. So the security of our accounts depends on a variety of things. Um, of course, we know how to keep our accounts secure in a well, we know in a in a very research oriented manner namely we know the problems that we need to research the problems we need to fix in order to keep secure uh we also know the same thing for service providers i don't know we know we need to take care of uh well we need to analyze service providers security policies their system security um for apps uh, we know how to verify uh again in principle how to verify uh, the security of apps how to deal with hardware security and so forth. But the new thing uh, in this problem is how do we actually deal with the aspect where our accounts are connected, okay? So knowing enough about security, we know that we cannot guarantee security. Some things will fail. And the problem then is that if things start failing in our account ecosystem, that because of the connections, other things may be at risk, all right? So our problem is how do we figure out which accounts are at risk due to the connections that exist in our account ecosystem. Okay, so as I said, I will use uh, Matt's Honan uh, example to, to build the so-called user account access graphs uh, for, his, uh, for his account. Uh, this was work that was jointly uh, published with uh, Sven Hamann, uh, Ralph Zasse, and David Basin, uh, all of them at TTH Zurich. All right, so if we read uh, Matt Honan's uh, publication on, on Wired, uh, we, we learned that essentially what he had were four accounts, uh, well, among many others, but these four are the ones that, that we care about or that he cared about and that were involved in his hack. So he had an iCloud account with Apple, uh, he had a password for that account. He had an Amazon account with its password, a Twitter account, and a Gmail account. Um, so what I'm starting to show you here is already an account access graph. I haven't defined them yet, but um, uh, you, I guess, will not have a problem understanding what I'm showing you here, namely uh, the password. If you know the password, you obtain access to, say, iCloud. If you know password two, you obtain access to Amazon and so forth. Um, when I'm drawing these uh, graphs, I omit uh, public information such as usernames uh, and email addresses uh, simply for simplicity. Okay, so this is where, where we start from. Um, I will not go into the topic of whether he shared any passwords with accounts or not. This was completely relevant. Um, for, for all we know, he actually had strong uh, distinct passwords for all of these accounts, and that's what this 
graph shows here. So different passwords for different accounts. So then these accounts were not independent. Um, if we read on what the hackers and uh, what we discovered and what we are told is that uh, Matt Honan's Twitter account, well, was not only accessible with the password. Another way to access the Twitter account was by well recovering access to it through the Gmail that uh, Matt Honan owned. Okay, so I'm drawing dashed arrows for recovery to an account. All right, so primary access methods are shown with solid arrows. Um, dashed arrows indicate um, a secondary or a recovery method. All right, now the Gmail account in turn uh, was again accessible through password four, say, but uh, also it recovered to the iCloud account. So if he lo ever lost his Gmail password, he could recover it um, by uh, by Google sending an email to, uh, to Matt Honan's iCloud account. All right, so um, our graph gets uh, more interesting. Now, if we go down to the iCloud account, uh, it becomes a bit more complicated. So as I said earlier, uh, the iCloud account was accessible through uh, uh, one of the passwords. Um, another way to recover access to the iCloud account was through Apple support. So you give Apple support a call, uh, and then you have to present some further credentials. One of them was, for instance, the answering security questions correctly. Okay, so what I'm showing here is, again, through the dashed arrows, that these are recovery uh, methods uh, by showing the arrows in the same color. So here, two red arrows. Uh, I'm indicating that in order to access the iCloud account, you need both. You need to call Apple support and you need to know the answers to the security questions. If you don't know this, an alternative method, uh, so a third method in this case, uh, to regain access uh, to the iCloud account is, again, Apple support, but this time knowing your billing address and knowing those last four digits uh, of a credit card number that you have on file with them. Um, yes, so the thing to, uh, to notice is equal colors mean you need all of the components in order to access an account. Different colors means alternatives. But um, for graphical representations, to, to make it easier to read these graphs and not have uh, 10 different colors, uh, I am using black always as a sufficient method to access an account. So anything in black is one sufficient method to access. Whereas anything color, black not being a color, anything that is colored uh, indicates that you need uh, all of the arrows of that color to access an account. All right, so this is recovery. So then we finally uh, can see the entire graph that is relevant to the attack that uh, uh, Matt Honan describes. Um, the new part here is Amazon. So. Uh, again, Amazon was accessible uh, through a password. Uh, a way to recover access to Amazon if you didn't have it was uh, by knowing your billing address and calling Amazon support. Now, this seems like too little to regain access. So this is where a flaw in uh, Amazon's customer support procedures uh, exists. So what the attackers abused here was that, in fact, if you call Amazon, uh, and you know your billing address, you can add a credit card to your file. So you can actually produce a credit card for anybody, well, or at the time you could, uh, by calling up Amazon support and knowing your billing address. So then what you do with that credit card that you have put freshly on file is you, well, you hang up this call, you call up Amazon again, and the second time you say, again, you have uh, lost access, they will this time quiz you whether you know your billing address and the credit card number. Well, since just minutes ago, uh, you just gave them a new credit card number. Well, you would know that one and give it to them again. And that's how you could regain access. So the attackers essentially abused this trick to, to gain access to uh, Matt Honan's Amazon account. All right, so now that they had this, the attackers were able to use this uh, access to Amazon, again, uh, to view the last four digits of all the credit cards that were on file, not only the one that the attackers gave, but actually also the ones that were there before. 
And at this point now, you can see how uh, they were able to hack uh, Matt Honan's accounts. They uh, used the last four digits of the credit card that Matt Honan had on his Amazon account. They used the billing address um, that they found uh, with publicly accessible information. Uh, they called Apple support, and that's how they were able to reset uh, his iCloud account password. So now they had control over his iCloud account that they used then to gain control over a Gmail account again by resetting uh, the Gmail password. And then finally, they used uh, the recovery method of Twitter, Twitter emailing Matt Holland's Gmail account to reset the password to Twitter. So this was sufficient for them to, to take over the Twitter account. This is exactly what this graph here shows. So, um, but before I go into the details of what I mean by this, maybe for, curio for your curiosity, why did Matt Honan lose all his files? Well, what the attackers also did was once, once they had control over an account, uh, they locked him out. So once they gained control over his iCloud account, they actually wiped all of his uh, iPhones, iPads, whatever uh, he had. Uh, that way, they prevented him from accessing uh, iCloud and trying to, to reset his things. Um, and this is where, where his uh, data loss came in. All right, but that, that was the side story. So back to, the, um, uh, back to the main story. So what we have here is a graph that shows us how we can access things uh, in this graph if we assume we know certain, uh, we have access to or we know certain information then this graph helps us establish what other access and information we can gain, okay? All right, so you now essentially understand what an account access graph is. Uh, I'll still give you the formal definition, but uh, if you are not into formal definitions, uh, you are not losing much. So formally, an account access graph is a directed graph. Um, and uh, the only special thing about it is that its edges are colored, okay? So we have a set CG uh, of colors. Uh, so an, uh, an edge, a directed edge in this graph uh, is not only uh, relating two vertices to each other, it also assigns a color to that edge. Um, all right, so that's what we've seen. And then the transitive access property that I've shown you uh, says that, well, if you have access to all the tail vertices of a particular color, then you also gain access to the head vertex of that color. Okay, and just to be precise, well, uh, if, you, if uh, a vertex does not have any incoming edges of a particular color, well, then you don't get access to it. So I need to assume that the edge set of, uh, of a particular color is non empty for this transitivity definition. All right, um, questions? Seems we have none. Mm -hmm. Then how do we then analyze this access graph? Well, you can say I've just done it. Um, I've essentially placed a few uh, uh, edges. Uh, sorry, I've uh, essentially uh, taken a few uh, vertices. I've said, if we have access to them, what else do we ha have access to? And I figured out that, yes, we can access Twitter. Um, so more formally, we define uh, an access base, which helps us analyze what minimal sets are necessary in order to gain access to, uh, to a certain account. Okay, now I do see something pop up here uh, with a question. Um, yes, uh, I'll, so I'll take this question because it relates to the story uh, I was telling earlier. Um, so, um, oh, wait, I might be breaking someone's privacy if I put this on the screen. Uh, so how did they manage to add another card uh, in Amazon? Um, and why did they need to call Amazon again? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. So my story about how uh, the hackers managed to take over the Amazon account uh, wasn't quite clear. So I'll, uh, I'll repeat that story. Um, so the hackers, to get access to Matt Holland's Amazon account, in principle, what they would need uh, uh -huh and this is maybe an omission of mine, uh, in principle, what they need is uh, information about uh, 
your Amazon account, such as the credit card number, your billing address, uh, and you need to call Amazon support. And indeed, this access method I'm not even showing in this graph. Um, so to gain access to Amazon, you need, for instance, uh, an email to, to, some, uh, uh, to some email account uh, that you control, or you need to know your credit card number that, that they have on file and your billing address. Now, the attackers didn't know that, but the loophole that they, that they um, abused was that if you just call Amazon and ask them to put a new credit card number on file, then they didn't go through this authentication procedure with you. They just accepted the new credit card number and put it on your file. And so if you now call them up, you don't need to authenticate. You essentially say who you are, what your billing address is, then you can add a new fresh credit card number. You then hang up, you call again later. And this time, when you say you have lost access to your account, well, this time they want to authenticate you. They will ask you exactly for a credit card number that's on file and your billing address. But now you know it because you as the attacker have just uh, previously called them with a, um, with a bogus credit card number. All right, uh, so this explained how um, uh, Amazon was hacked uh, or how Matt Honan's Amazon account was hacked. Um, but so back to how we do this formally. So if we, um, if we want to know for any of the accounts or any of the uh, information that we have in one of the accounts, how we can access that, what we compute, um, sorry, what we first establish is a so-called uh, access set. So uh, an access set, is defined as the set of vertices that are sufficient to gain uh, access to an account. Uh, so let me just take an example here again with Amazon. So for instance, in this graph, it says I'm calling Amazon support and having a billing address is sufficient for access to Amazon. So these two vertices together would be an access set for Amazon. Uh, the singleton set of the password is also an access set for Amazon. And of course, if you have access to Amazon, you have access to Amazon. So uh, just the singleton set of Amazon is also an access set. Um, now, an access base is defined as all such access sets for an account, uh, but in fact, all such minimal access sets. All right. So in fact, the three sets that I just mentioned are all uh, part of Amazon's access base because they're all minimal in that if you remove any element from those sets, then you do not have access to Amazon any longer. So for instance, uh, the only interesting set here being Amazon support and billing address. If I remove the billing address from this set, then Amazon support alone is not sufficient to access Amazon. Okay. All right, so uh, by computing the access basis for an account, uh, we know all the uh, necessary or all the alternatives um, for accessing that account, each of these alternatives contains only the necessary vertices to access the account. So Amazon here is not a very interesting example. Um, let's look at um, a more interesting example. Let's look at the, the one that the attackers were actually after, the Twitter account. Um, I will not go through every single one of these sets, um, but you just by looking at the first few, you see exactly how they're built. So, uh, well, to act to gain access to Twitter, you could have access to Twitter. Uh, another way to access Twitter, so we um, go backwards. So another way to access Twitter is just a password. Uh, another one is to recover through Gmail. Uh, then you can ask yourself, well, how do we gain access to Gmail? Uh, that would be an alternative way to access Twitter because Gmail itself gives you access. Therefore, having access to password four gives you transitively access to Twitter. That's this set. Uh, and so forth, all the way down to, say, a set where you need the billing address, Amazon support, and Apple support, uh, and that is sufficient to access Twitter. And this is roughly what the adversaries abused, uh, namely that knowing uh, Matt Honan's billing address, using Amazon support and Apple support, they were able to access Twitter. Um, I see I have one more question. Um, Ah, yes, uh, it's a very good question. So uh, this is back to how did the, um, 
the hackers access uh, Amazon, namely they first added a credit card. And the question is, can we model this in, in, in the graph? And no, the access graphs that we currently have do not consider uh, uh, sort of right access to an account uh, as a um, as a feature. So the therefore the way that I'm representing it is the consequence of being able to add such a credit card means that it is sufficient to just have a billing address and access to Amazon support in order to um, gain access to the Amazon account. Um, but yes, the, the fact that some access means we can modify information, some other access means we can read information, and maybe there's a third access kind that just means it provides further access to other means um, is, uh, is something that we consider looking at in future work. Okay, so at this point, what we know is what an access graph is, how we build one. And now that we understand access bases, we also see how we can essentially analyze what possibilities an attacker has to access uh, an account. But to really analyze the security um, of an access graph, uh, we can do much more. So what we want, if we wanted to analyze uh, a user's uh, account access graph for security, we would first want to define some uh, criterion. It is not just about which accounts give you access to, to some other account. Um, it is also about how difficult is it to access one account versus, say, another. So two criteria that I give here as an example are, for instance, you would might want that your important accounts are at least as difficult to access from the adversary's point of view as less important accounts. Uh, another reasonable one, and this is the one that we will later look at again in detail, uh, is that recovery access methods should be at least as difficult uh, to provide access to, a, to an account as the primary account access methods. All right, this is exactly what, uh, what Pitt, Matt Honan, and many others in other attacks, that the recovery access methods turn out to be easier for the attackers than the uh, primary uh, account access methods. All right, so once we have defined such a evaluation criterion, some, some essentially some security property we're interested in, then um, we define a so-called scoring scheme um, with respect to criteria that we find relevant. So for instance, the uh, threat model, uh, some people may consider their main uh, threat actors to be local actors. I don't know, your roommates perhaps. Um, others might be mostly worried about uh, remote adversaries and, um, and would like to protect against those. Uh, yet others might actually want to take into account what the skill of an attacker uh, is. Um, another criterion for scoring schemes is uh, how much trust do you place in your service provider? So uh, we might trust that uh, Google, Facebook, uh, and Amazon are, are able to keep our um, data secure, but perhaps some uh, local email provider might not be uh, as, um, as big and therefore not as uh, secure. Um, and then finally, I think to consider in a scoring scheme might be uh, the quality of your own credentials. So you, you probably know which of your passwords you are strong, which ones are not. All right, so defining a scoring scheme, um, well, so I will show you how to define a scoring scheme that, um, that takes into account uh, a variety of, uh, of factors. So once we have such a scoring scheme uh, with, uh, with respect to, as I call them, relevant criteria, and I have some evaluation that I want to perform, well, then um, I, I score the graph with respect to it, and uh, I evaluate my criterion. So three easy steps to analyze our account access graphs. Um, so let's see how we define scoring schemes then. Um, so we use the access basis that we just discussed as a, uh, as a basis to compute uh, security scores. Um, the way we do this is we start by, oh, no, the, the way I first need to explain this is um, uh, what the security score models. So a security score models the attacker's difficulty to access a vertex, all right? So uh, a higher security score means, yeah, it's harder for the attacker uh, to access a vertex. Uh, well, then, once, uh, now that we have said this, uh, a scoring scheme essentially starts uh, from an initial valuation of uh, 
our vertices in an account access graph. Um, let me start immediately with an example. So for instance, um, I, I assign uh, security scores to the, the various account providers. Um, here, I just chose uh, three as a security score for all of the accounts. So for Twitter, Gmail, um, iCloud, Amazon. So these are my initial uh, scores that I give to, to the account providers. Then I give, um, in this example, lower scores to uh, passwords, in essentially indicating that I think it is harder for an attacker to directly hack Twitter than it is for the attacker to uh, find my password. Um, so I'm giving my passwords or Matt Holland's passwords here uh, a security, security score of two. Um, and then information that I think would have been easy to find, such as the credit card number, the billing address, um, or even the answer to security questions, I give an even lower score here, the score one. And finally, I think everybody can call up a support hotline. So uh, I gave them the lowest score, zero. OK. So these are this is the so-called initial valuation of all of these uh, uh, accounts and uh, pieces of information. All right. So this is, if you were to directly try to compromise this piece or this vertex, how hard do you value it? Now, the purpose of the scoring scheme is to now compute from all of this uh, a final score for how hard it is to access a particular account or information. All right, so this is what uh, I'll show you next. All right, so here we just have numbers that, uh, that we have assigned um, based on, um, well, here I just based it on reputation and my own uh, uh, belief about how strong a password is or isn't. Um, now, scoring schemes are uh, very uh, general. So you can define a scoring scheme over any partially ordered set. I, uh, I'm choosing uh, integers here right now, but uh, in principle, you can use multi-sets. Any other type of uh, partially ordered, ordered set is fine. All you have to do is you have to define two functions. Uh, the uh, a first function that takes an access set uh, remember, say for Amazon, an access set was Amazon support and billing address. So eval set, the function takes an access set and assigns a value to that access set, so a security value to the set based on the vertices values in the set. Okay, so a typical thing you might want to assign to eval set is say the sum of scores uh, or the maximum of scores, essentially indicating that in an access set, remember all of the vertices uh, in it are necessary to access the vertex. Therefore, you can reason that, well, it, if you need all of them to access, then your score should be probably at least as, as high as the highest of them. So that would be the reasoning for a max function for eval set, for instance. So once you have given scores to each of your um, access sets, you, you then need to somehow combine all of these access sets into a final score for an account that you're interested in. Well, to combine them, this essentially combines all the alternatives you have to access an account. Well, and if you have many alternatives, you will probably want to go for the easiest one of them as an attacker. Therefore, uh, a typical choice for a combined function is to use the minimum function. Okay. But again, you can use other functions that, that mimic the same type of uh, uh, intuition. So what I've just essentially described is a so-called max then min uh, scoring scheme. Namely, you look at the uh, access base, say for Twitter. Uh, why don't we do that? Uh, you look at the access base for Twitter. I'm repeating it here. You've seen this on a previous slide. Um, you then compute the max scores of each of the uh, access sets. And finally, you, you take the minimum of all of these uh, uh, scores in order to evaluate um, the score, say, for Twitter here. Um, just to do one example, so the last set, again, the billing address, Amazon support and Apple support, well, the max of their scores is one, since Apple support and Amazon are zero, uh, billing address is one. So this last set here, eval set would assign uh, the score one to it. Oops, sorry about that. So if, uh, eval set would assign the score one to it. Uh, similarly, it would assign scores to everything else. There is no uh, set that has a score zero, so we know that the minimum over all of these sets will be a one, and therefore 
uh, the security score for Twitter by this scoring scheme with the initial values that we gave them would be one. Okay. So as you see, I've chosen one particular scheme. I've chosen one particular valuation. I've of course reasoned why I think that this valuation was um, was um, uh, plausible. Um, but this is just one method out of many that you could choose um, to to assign initial values um, and valuations to these graphs. Um, as I said earlier, you can take into account attackers, reputation, and so forth. All right. Um, so oh, there is one question before I move on. Um, uh -huh. So what is the, oh yes, uh, that's a very good question. So what is the role of the initial value uh, for say the top vertices such as Twitter? Indeed, um, if, if you look at the paper that we wrote, we, we do not require that you give an initial value to all the vertices. Um, it, in many cases, you might actually only want to, uh, to give values to your leaf vertices, such as, um, uh, such as passwords that you have and so on. But by giving it also to intermediate vertices and in particular to accounts, what you are modeling is how difficult you think it is to directly compromise the account. So if you want to consider your, say, security of Twitter, um, it is not only about how hard is it to, to hack your uh, passwords or how hard is it to hack any of the providers on the way, it is also a question of how hard is it to hack Twitter. Uh, if, if Twitter had a very poor reputation for, uh, for, for its own system security or security policies, it might actually be, make sense to give it a much lower uh, value than, say, you value your passwords. You might think your password, uh, I don't know, is 500 characters long and has been randomly chosen by a quantum random generator or something. Um, you might think this is unbreakable and much stronger than Twitter's uh, system security or something. And in that case, you might want to give it a higher score. Um, so so it, you can, if you want to model this, you can give uh, scores to accounts, meaning this is uh, your valuation of the account provider's security. Um, yes, and so the, the next question is, can this be a way to model, uh, for instance, social engineering attacks? So I'm trying to interpret the question. Um, um, I, yes, so <laughs> yes, I think uh, I, I can say yes, and here's how I would uh, interpret this. Uh, for instance, if I can call Amazon support um, and get by with exactly the hack that I described, namely that uh, that I didn't I didn't know. Um, uh, a necessary piece, a necessary credential uh, in order to gain access or in order to be authenticated as the legitimate owner of an account. Uh, as a good social engineer, I might get by, I'm being complicated here, as a good social engineer, I might get through uh, customer support and convince them that I am somebody uh, with fewer credentials than are strictly necessary by their own policy. So if I believe that, then yes, then I, um, I could take that into account in evaluation. So um, in this case, it would be uh, for the security of my Amazon account directly. So what I've done in modeling uh, Matt Honan's attack, I've, I've modeled uh, the attack directly as these are the two pieces of information that were necessary to gain access to Amazon. I could alternatively model, say, the ability of social engineering Amazon's customer support people by giving um, the Amazon account a very low score. Yes, so the, the, the scores here don't necessarily show the reason for why I'm doing it. But as I said, if you use a, a multi-set or some other type of valuation technique, you could pack all of those things into, it, um, into your valuation. Okay. So, all right, so where do we stand? We have now seen right, what uh, attack graphs are. We have seen uh, access bases that say which things are necessary to access uh, uh, a vertex. 
we have now given them values and we have used scoring schemes uh, to, to then compute an overall security value for um, a specific vertex. Um, if we look at uh, our program, uh, well, what I've just discussed was uh, number two. So how do we give, uh, how do we define a scoring scheme? Um, what I haven't actually done yet is I haven't chosen an evaluation criterion. And so what I will be choosing now is uh, uh, the, the second of these two bullet points, namely, I want to be sure that in this graph of Matthonens, or I want to check whether in this graph of Matthonens, it is at least as hard to access Twitter through recovery access methods as it is through primary account access methods. Uh, to do this, uh, we defined the concept of a backdoor. Um, so a backdoor for us uh, exists in an account if it is easier for the adversary to well, access the account through a recovery method than exclusively through primary access methods. All right, so this is exactly the problem um, that we said Matt Honan had. It was easier for the attacker to, um, to go through recovery than through the methods that anybody who has an account with any provider first thinks of. So again, if we, if we have any accounts with uh, Apple, Twitter, whatever, we are usually focused on how do we normally access our accounts, how strong are our passwords, how strong are our second factors, and so on. However, um, we frequently don't even know all the possible ways that we could recover access to an account if we lose primary access methods. Uh, so by defining the backdoor, as, such, as uh, stated here, we are testing whether this ignorance of a user in how access methods uh, or recovery access methods work, whether this ignorance is, uh, is safe or not. And as we will see, it is not a safe uh, thing not to know how um, your accounts can also be accessed. All right, so the question is, so how do we check whether an account has uh, a potential backdoor? Well, what we do is very simple. We compute the score as I just did for Twitter. So once in the normal graph as it is, and then one more time, but this time in the subgraph of the account graph where all the recovery edges have been removed. So this looks, uh, this is much easier to understand in this picture. Um, so on the left, you see the account graph as we have uh, seen it before. Uh, on the right, I have removed all the recovery edges. All right. So now what I do is I compute the score on the left and I see, well, uh, well from before, we know that access to Twitter was scored at one. On the right, if I were to redo this uh, scoring scheme, well, I would obtain a max score, uh, a score for Twitter as two. And the reason for that is that, well, in this graph, Twitter's access base is consisting of Twitter itself and um, of the password. These are, this is the only way to access Twitter, either directly um, by compromising Twitter, which has difficulty three, or the normal way, the primary way, by um, providing um, the password. So the max of Twitter is three, the max of password is two, but the min of the two, that's the combined function, is two. Therefore, the overall score of Twitter here is two, and that is a higher score than the score that allows for recovery methods and therefore, we say that Twitter in Matt Honan's graph has uh, a backdoor. Okay. Um, so this is now a point where I will switch topics slightly, and I see there is a uh, there is a comment, um, but I may not know the context. So it says I can always satisfy this definition. I have to find out which. Um, by putting a high score for the usual method or a low score. I'm trying to find this definition. Uh, so if I can speak, it's yeah, like yes, the, do. the definition of security is relative to, to whatever scores you put at the beginning, right? So you say that, yes. uh, so my point is that um, if you put the so the question is what should be a reasonable choice for the initial like for the password because if I put the, that the Twitter password is has security two and then some password lower 
in the tree or some access methods has security three and so on. Like I know I can always with a, how to choose the right uh, initial scores. I guess that's the question. Yeah, make the, the definition meaningful because actually that was my initial impression that okay, this doesn't define security in absolute terms. So I don't, don't know like. So in what sense, okay, then I understood about the concept of a backdoor, maybe in what sense this becomes a notion of security, but, but it's still relative in some sense. Exactly. So yes, uh, now I know which slide to go back to, um, to, yeah, to comment further on it. Um, indeed, we, yeah, we first have to define an evaluation criterion. So for instance, here recovery, uh, uh, the, the second bullet is, is recovery, um, Sorry, is access through recovery methods easier than through primary methods? Um, we we then in defining the the scoring scheme itself, we want to define what is relevant to us when we analyze the security. So um, yes, do we consider the threat model, or do we just not have enough information about maybe the threat model to to take this in, into account in a score? Uh, do we want to consider just the trust that we have? Um, do we want to consider the quality of credentials? So we, we need to make a choice of what do we find relevant when we um, create a valuation. And that is what's defining our initial evaluation. So, um, and what is defining uh, uh, the this scoring scheme itself. So, yeah, but uh, this, this like, doesn't this create the danger of mixing? Like, we, if you model the threat model for some nodes, you model the trust for some other nodes, then suddenly we are mixing, I don't know, uh, yes. fruits and apples and oranges. And... That is correct. So you're, yes, the, the soundness of your scoring scheme is then something that you need to uh, give give some um, support for. Yes. So indeed, you can, you can define nonsensical scoring schemes. Um, easily you you can uh, <laughs> I, I was trying to give an example of something that's clearly nonsensical but i uh, right now i'm failing um but in, indeed if, if you if you look at the paper we also we also do give some soundness criteria for scoring schemes such as if you, you what you would want is at least that the scoring scheme satisfies that uh if two accounts are being accessed by uh, by access sets where one is a subset of another, then you would want that that the harder to access account clearly gets a higher score. So your scoring scheme should have should respect this type of uh, relations in order to be uh, to have a chance of being a sound scoring scheme. Um, so you, you yes, you can mess up a lot in such a definition. Our goal here was just to provide a very basic uh, and, and general, way of um, no, general rather than basic way of um, defining scoring schemes but now it is the responsibility of whoever defines it to to make sure that that it makes sense what they're defining in general of course assigning especially a numerical score to any um, security uh, uh, mechanism is very difficult you, you know what does it mean that my password is security five it means nothing um, it, yeah, what I've tried in the example that I've given is to uh, to just differentiate between the size of the numbers. So instead of giving labels such as uh, high security, medium security, low security, I just gave it explicit numbers. Um, but it is yes, it is in that assignment and the choice of the scoring scheme that uh, that I could be also making mistakes and then getting nonsensical scores back. That's correct. Um, all right, so with all of those comments, uh, what we now have is a way of analyzing the security of, uh, of an access graph. Uh, this is not the only thing that, that, we, uh, that we as users uh, care about. In fact, most of the time, what we care about is the availability of, uh, of our accounts. So we do not like to lose access to our accounts. We do not like to, uh, to be locked out of our accounts. Um, I think in the off the record questions, I can go into the semantics of this slide. Um, for now, this is just my slide to show that availability can fail. Um, so, avail so measuring availability of an of an account graph works 
analogous to measuring security, of course, there's one change, which is, well, this time we're not interested in what accounts provide access, say, to an attacker to which other accounts, but rather the lack of what may lead to being locked out of accounts. So what was our access base now is not suitable anymore to assess availability of accounts or the possibility of lockout. We have to change the definition of these basic sets and therefore we, we have to define lockout sets. But once we have defined those, um, the rest works analogously. Again, our scoring schemes will have to respect the nature of lockout rather than access, um, but they again work analogously to the scoring schemes we discussed before. So, so then the concept of a lockout set, what is it? Um, so I define uh, the lockout set for a particular vertex. Uh, let's, I don't know, let's take Amazon here perhaps, um, as uh, it is the set of vertices that can transitively prevent access um, to an account. So uh, with Amazon here, if I don't have access to the password, and I don't have access to either Amazon or the billing address, well, then I will not be able to access Amazon. So um, one lockout set, therefore, is password to and, say, Amazon support. If I don't have access to either, I cannot access uh, Amazon. Another lockout set would be password to and billing address, because if I don't have access to either, I cannot access Amazon. Uh, a more complicated example uh, is access to iCloud. So if I want to look at what could cause lockout from iCloud uh, for a user, well, it means in a first instance that I cannot use any of the three direct methods, which means certainly uh, if I don't have access to password one and I don't have access to, let's say, the security question, uh, and the credit card number, well, then I won't have access to iCloud because for each of the three direct methods, I, I'm missing at least one credential. Um, but there are other lockout sets for iCloud. For instance, in this graph, uh, if I don't have access to the password, if I don't have, a, uh, or I don't know the answer to the security question, and I don't have access to the Amazon account, I can also be well transitively locked out because Amazon in this graph is the one account that provides access to the credit card number, meaning that if I don't have access to Amazon, I might not have access to the credit card number, and therefore I might not have access to iCloud. So if we look at this, this does not make sense. Um, we clearly would say my access to the credit card number is not dependent on Amazon. So this is now here an artifact of me having modeled this graph uh, based on the attack scenario rather than based on everything that is actually relevant uh, in the account uh, ecosystem of Matt Honan. So just to uh, fix this, in fact, the credit card number is not something that uh, that only can be accessed uh, if I have access to Amazon. It in for, for Matt Honan, it would mean his normal access is he has the physical credit card at home. He looks up the number, and that's how he gets that number. Um, so, if I want to actually analyze uh, this graph with respect to availability, I would have to. Uh, model it more accurately, namely, I would at least have to represent the fact that uh, the, the user has access to a physical credit card. And indeed, if we do this, then well, the previous set password one security questions and Amazon is not a lockout set anymore, because I ha do have the alternative of accessing the credit card number uh, from the physical credit card. But now if I assume that I don't have access to the physical credit card, I don't have access to Amazon, I forgot my security question, and I forgot my password, well then, again, I might be locked out of iCloud. Okay, so this is just uh, a way of giving an idea how lockout sets work. Um, since the rest works um, analogously, I will not spend time uh, on this. Uh, I do see that I am about to run over time. So, I've now just told you everything about how we formally model these graphs, how we evaluate these graphs. Uh, the one thing I haven't told you about is um, 
what real users uh, account graphs look like. Uh, so it depends on you whether you're giving me another few minutes um, uh, to to discuss uh, well the second what would have been the second part of the study. Um, yeah, if you can do it in five minutes, <laughs> I'll try to do it in five minutes. All right. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'll pick up the pace a little on this. So uh, th this bit here is now based on uh, well on work with the same authors as before, and this time also with uh, Michael Crabb uh, from the University of Dundee. Um, in in this bit, what we wanted to do is we wanted to actually see whether our, our account graphs work uh, in reality. So what does a real user's account graph work? Not something that that was our own graphs. Uh, something that we can pick up from, you know, reading an article such as Matt Honan's uh, attack, but something that that we actually elicit from real users. Um, we did a study where the main limitations are these were young people, these were uh, um, computer literate people. Uh, um, they were most of them probably university students because they uh, they lived close to a university uh, in in Zurich. Uh, we gathered 20 of them and we made a study in two steps. One was uh, trying to elicit an account access graph uh, for them. And then a second step where we use this graph to have a discussion with them about their account security. Uh, and the, these people signed up for it because they were told we're running a, a study on the security risks in user accounts. Um, so we had a systematic way to, uh, to elicit these graphs. I will. I'll skip the details of it, but uh, we always followed the same script, if you will, with each of the 20 members. Um, we did ask them to bring their equipment with them so that for, for questions that about accounts that they might not know the answer, uh, that they could look it up uh, during the interview. Uh, and in a way that the interviewer, this was Sven Hamann in this case, uh, would not uh, actually see their private information. So they used their own screen. The interviewer did not have access to that. Uh, they were also encouraged to use nicknames for their accounts. We really did not want to know neither their passwords nor email addresses. Uh, we just wanted to, um, to understand the relationship between these uh, to each other. Um, and so here's how one such uh, account access graph looks like. Um, this is uh, um, well, one of 20, as I said. Um, what we what we saw in general in these account graphs was that we managed to elicit 30 to 59 vertices uh, in each of these uh, interviews. The actual numbers are likely higher because we frequently ask them um, not to give us every uh, account, but rather the important accounts, uh, the everyday accounts. And then we ask them questions such as, if you were to set up a new account, how would you do it? And this is what we call the default account. So for instance, in this user here, uh, the boxes show that there, that there are many accounts following a similar pattern. In other words, uh, if this user were to create a new account, by default, they would just choose a password, um, put it into a password manager, and that would be their, uh, their, their standard access to an account. Um, there would not be a particular recovery method here. Whereas if they have serious accounts, then, um, oh, actually also no recovery method, sorry about that. Um, um, ah, yes, I, sorry, I'm slow reading my own graph here, or uh, uh, it's not my graph, it's the person 18's graph. Um, so if, if this person was to um, create a serious account, they would, uh, they would usually try to access it through whatever this uh, mail provider is. So this is, uh, a provider that would then provide them access to their more serious accounts. So they have a strategy of differentiating more uh, uh, important things from less important things. Um, other things that we saw was that most users uh, had uh, text messages as a second factor, either to access an account or as a recovery factor. So for this particular person here, you would see that uh, they use uh, text messages to recover access to their email. What we also see in this graph, and this happened quite a lot, is that their phone 
while locked still provides access uh, to their text messages. So in other words, the lock screen of the phone, if a text message comes in, it would show what or it would show a preview of the text message, which frequently shows you uh, a code that is sent to you by SMS. Um, if they unlock the phone with uh, their finger and, and other parts necessary, well, and the phone uh, and the locked phone, then they will gain access to the proper phone, which then gives them, for instance, access um, to the basic mail account. So this edge here, for instance, models that their phone is always logged, uh, logged in to this uh, mail account. Um, right, so, well, in the interest of time, let me show you one other type of graph uh, and features. What we saw in some of the, um, I think in about a third, uh, yes, one in three uh, uh, graphs was that they have uh, cycles. So frequently they have accounts that recover, frequently among the, that third of users, that is, uh, they had accounts that recover each other. Um, so the cycle mail P basic, uh, where is mail P basic up here? Uh, so with this uh, provider mail P basic, I can access uh, this other also mail provider, but this other mail provider I can use to recover access uh, to this mail P uh, provider which then gives me again access to uh, the basic mail facilities of this P provider. Uh, so we, we have a cycle here where either having access to one or the other uh, restores access to, uh, to the other one. Um, so as I said, this was a two-staged interview. Um, what we did between the two stages, or what again Sven Hamann did between the two stages was he analyzed the graphs that were elicited in this way he checked for backdoors as I defined them earlier. He checked for four particular backdoors, namely whether uh, SIM swapping attacks that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk would be a problem, whether compromising passwords would be a backdoor, whether uh, compromising weak secrets would be, or whether maybe the theft of a device would be a backdoor. Um, and he also then inspected the graphs uh, manually. Uh, he did find two of the four backdoors, namely the text message attacker, the one that could say carry out a SIM swapping attack, uh, would have been a problem for, for everybody who uses uh, text-based recovery. Um, but also the device theft attacker would be a problem, namely for those users that did not have a locking mechanism um, on their phone, or even if they did have a locking me mechanism allowed uh, previews of text messages. Uh, the things that he found uh, manually were that uh, people did not use multi-factor authentication, even for crucial accounts. Um, and uh, well, during the interviews, he also found out that people fully or partially reused passwords. This is not a surprise, uh, but we don't show these uh, password reuses in our accounts. Uh, then in a second stage, uh, he then had a discussion with people based on the account graphs and based on the attacks that, that he found. So that he used those attacks as a starting point to essentially see what people thought of them, whether they were surprised by them. Uh, he discussed particular features such as uh, vertices that had a high out degree, that is, gave access to many other things. Um, and uh, in particular, this was a topic when, when he knew that uh, an account that they mentioned would also provide multi-factor uh, authentication. Um, so this led to a variety of topics, uh, and some of the recurring themes were indeed, uh, you know, discussions of the implications of the connections between accounts. So people were surprised uh, by how how connected these graphs were. Uh, and then, well, again, in the interest of time, this is the one thing that. Uh, that encourages us the most, which is that indeed you can show these account graphs to people uh, and you can talk to them about the security of these graphs, uh, about their own unique graphs, and they will have a, a, an understanding of uh, what these things mean. Um, so, all right, my, the last minus one minute that I have is sort of the, the takeaway from everything that I've just told you which is that, so where do I think we need to go with this? Uh, and well, what I think is we need to, we need a tool that helps us manage our account ecosystems. If you, if you look at the connectivity of, of all these account graphs, if you look at um, uh, say these SIM swap attacks again, if you look at how were people informed about there being a huge problem that they had no clue about, 
well it was essentially through the media if you if you weren't paying attention you would uh, you would be at risk of being hacked uh, due to something you didn't even know existed um, few of us know how to recover things um, here people learned about there being an attack where people can steal their sim card therefore um, then start stealing their other accounts something that people just would not connect why should my phone uh, be connected to uh, to any accounts that that I care about. Um, so, right. So the problem of managing our account ecosystems uh, is that well, each of our account ecosystems is unique. So if we wanted uh, to build something for someone, well, if we first wanted to even analyze it, uh, we we cannot analyze this in generality. We have to analyze people's. Uh, a unique account ecosystem to to provide anything of value um, and well what we know at this point is yes our account graphs uh, work for that they can visualize things to people they can explain to people well what uh, what is happening and as an analytical tool they work um, to to uncover problems um, but if we want to protect users account ecosystems then we need a tool that empowers them to manage their own accounts uh, the only thing we have at the moment are password managers, and they're woefully inadequate for this topic because they track, well, how you access one particular account. They do not track how you access, uh, what the connections are between your accounts. Frequently, they don't even track how you, how you recover access to an account. So the challenges that we have in going forward um, are that, well, if we want to provide such a tool to people, we need to let them uh, discover or cre create their account access graph. However, this is very time consuming at the moment. Each of our interviews lasted between one and one and a half hours to uh, elicit this information. We would have to automate this and we would have to make this a lot quicker. All right. So the question is, how do we minimize the, the time it takes uh, uh, between the tool and, uh, and the user to, to make this possible? In this process, of course, there will be errors. So how do we discover these errors? Uh, how do we correct them uh, is the next challenge. Um, and then once we have all of this information, hopefully relatively error-free, then how do we actually provide security guidance to them based on their uh, account graph in a way that they understand? Um, and then if we have solved all of these three bullet points, well, there will still be privacy concerns. We, at this point, don't also understand um, what parts of an account graph should be considered as very sensitive information and what parts are, are okay to share if the user is, is happy with that. Um, so in summary, we have developed these account graphs uh, as, a, as a method to analyze account ecosystems. We have seen that, that they work very well to communicate with users. Uh, we do think that they are useful uh, in the future to, to provide something like an account manager rather than a password manager. Um, and well, there's you know, plenty of future work uh, to do that. All right, um, this was a bit faster than, than you or I maybe wanted, but this is it. Okay, let's take more questions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe I have a question about the privacy at the end. Uh, okay, there is also. Uh, so, do you, so you said you want to share, uh, let users share some of the information. So you share with whom and in what sense share? What like what parts of the graph you want to let them share? This is exactly the part that uh, that I say is is a challenge, and I I don't have any of the answers to. Uh, so the, I, I assume you're uh, referring to the privacy concerns. Um, it. It, at, at this point, I find it hard to to say what we should consider sensitive information and what not. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, we are not going to share the value of a password. Uh, the fact that I'm accessing an account with a password is not so sensitive. But maybe the the, the how the accounts are linked together is sensitive. After all, this is the starting point of how, say, you know, my motivating example started. Uh, the, the attackers figured out the account graph essentially uh, for or 
at the subgraph hanging on Twitter for Matt Honan, and that's what enabled them to then find uh, uh, a vulnerability somewhere that allowed them to chain all these attacks up to, to Twitter. Um, so, you know, should we therefore consider this private information or not? Should we, you know, if I, what I've shown you earlier were anonymized graphs in the sense that I'm not telling you what, even what account provider was there, um, but still, have I maybe shared too much information about these people's but, uh, graphs? But you mean share with whom? Share with the... With oh, share with the public, publicize. Ah, publicize. So why would why, why would I do that? Like, what's what's the interest? Uh, well, the interest is if I am trying to create an account management tool uh, for for the masses. Um, if uh, so, do I want to say that everything related to this uh, to these graphs must always stay on the on the user's computer, never leave the computer, um, or would I want any uh, information about what graphs typically look like? You know to be collected so that i can what is it improve the in quotes the services that i render to them um i yeah i wouldn't know uh, the answers to that okay, okay thanks mm -hmm. okay all right uh yeah hi thanks uh, so i'll just start by saying that's a really fascinating piece of work that you described and i really i i understand what went into it and i really appreciate all that so thanks for the work the paper and uh, and this talk um but i'm struck by something that i'll just make a comment that, that i don't mean to be pejorative uh although it might sound that way right. it seems like this is a a, a pretty sophisticated band-aid or other kinds of problems that might should have been solved. Uh, and so, and, and there are lots of these things in the, in the security community. So my question here is, can you say perhaps one thing that some of these vendors could do to obviate the problems that you have described today? Hmm, I, as such, I don't think it is just a band-aid. I, I, I appreciate your your comment. The, the The problem we have is, um, as I said at the beginning, there will be there will be security issues. We cannot avoid this with specific systems, apps. You know, in our security ecosystem, there will be problems. Our the problem for the users, for the end users, is that they cannot possibly be aware of, of all the issues that are happening, um, even, in fact, for their own accounts. So account access, I, 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 as a user, want to know that I can access my, my accounts with one password or maybe a two-factor, maybe a single sign-on. This is sort of, as a user, what is expected of me at the minimum. Um, I should be allowed to, to be unaware of, of all the other ways of accessing the account. Um, they are necessary because I might, I might lose my primary access method, and then I will be glad that there is another way I can prove uh, who I am and regain this access. So from, again, from the system provider's point of view, or uh, uh, service provider's point of view, it is necessary to keep recovery methods present um, so, well, if, if you then ask for due diligence, so they need to make sure that, that these are not surprising to me as a user, but I, again, I'm not sure that, that they can, that they can always satisfy this, this requirement. Um, all the service providers are independent entities. They will, their goal is to, is to make it possible for their large user base to, to, to not lose access to whatever valuable data their users have. So they will come up with authentication methods to ensure this. Other account providers will come up with different methods and there's just no guarantee that there is no funny interaction between these that wouldn't harm some user. Well, let's, we let's, look, let's look at this a different way then. Yeah. Um, you know, each one of these vendors, as you point out, has 
what, what you might characterize as a different way of allowing people to recover an account. Can you say that any of these vendors has the best way, right? Perhaps a little bit flawed, but still better than the rest. And if there is such a, an example, why is it that all the rest of these people cannot do the same thing? Right, you're talking about security flaws that are unavoidable. Yes, yes. So if we... And, yes. and, and, as a guy who's been doing reliable systems for a while, I find this uh, curious. Well, let's say there is one best way. What we would need is that every vendor then uses this one best way. Uh, I, I, well, I don't think we can hope for that. Somehow our, our whole, all our vendors, in fact, live um, or, or uh, exist because they keep changing the ways we interact with them. Uh, they need to give us new, shinier uh, ways of accessing and so on. And change is what, what it seems drives them and, and, and their income. So if, from a security perspective, yes, we would want to be very conservative and say, here's the, the one way we can prove things work. Let's have everybody use that one way. And then there's no funny interactions because, yes, we, we have a very simple system that we can prove the security of. But it, it's just not going to, to live for long because the next thing is, the, you know, we're about to do what? FIDO2. We're about to invent yet another way of accessing many systems because we're getting rid of uh, passwords. Uh, or that's our goal. Now, in this transition to this new way, which is supposed to be better because we're getting rid of pesky passwords, we will have this 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 time where some providers will have signed up to the new things others not and all it means for users is they now have a more complicated ecosystem with more ways of of things going wrong all because technically the vendors want to do the right thing they want to make it safer to access well their own systems by getting rid of passwords yeah okay i you know i, I understand all that but let's look at this from a slightly different point of view mm -hmm. Um, you had a nice uh, a graph that you presented kind of early on in, in, in the discussion here. And you had assigned um, scores for, for the various uh, paths and vendors. Why not create a, a monthly or maybe a biannually uh, re report that just says, here's a vendor, Amazon, Twitter, whoever, right? And here's their score. And just shame them into doing better by making a public report. This has I, been done, this has been done in other industries. So why yes. not? Uh, but yes, and this, well, I, I told you the motivation was 2012, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, this was essentially what we had been thinking of. It is you have all these vendors, you, you can analyze their own security, their own methods, how they behave. Uh, we even built a model for essentially the four fundamental ways you can authenticate a user and so on. But the problem is not them in isolation. Uh, them in isolation, they might have a certain score, but the problem is that certain interactions between how they do things and how another vendor does things may turn out to not be um, to not be secure. It's the composition of two secure systems that may not be secure in the end. Um, I think you're saying that we should just give up. No, no, no. So, so what I'm what I'm saying is we what, do that. <laughs> no, what I'm saying is we, we have a we have a dynamic system. We have a system where every user is free to 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 choose vendors to put them into their ecosystem to use their services. However, because we have all this choice, we we need to have a tool that analyzes the consequences of having all of these services together. And that means something else for every, each one of us. Some of us, you know, uh, live with say Google and have all our important data with Google's, others don't. So, so we, it's not only that the service provider needs to be secure for, for all of us, it, it needs to be more secure for some of us than for others. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we have all these unique aspects to everyone's ecosystem that we need to consider. And the, the way to do it, uh, I propose, is by, um, uh, by representing them, well, as this account graph, as, um, as scores that are based on what the user finds important, not necessarily what we 
what we as a security community give as a score to yeah uh, but wait a minute but the user user will not like it's the user will just assign some scores well i actually we discussed about this previously like uh, the user has to know how to assign scores and so on so but okay let's admit that but actually coming back to this suggestion that yes we can the vendors could uh, yes actually it's a problem it's a problem of the ecosystem but it still can be viewed from a global perspective right it's not like you can detect the problems you don't need to look at the individual user to to look at the individual account graph to detect if there are problems because basically it's just it's just like uh, you maybe it's a new i don't know if it's an infinite search space but it's like a search space which could it's like the ecosystem which allows to create certain scenarios so so and so you, in theory you could immediately when a new like when google creates a new method it you could immediately evaluate the interaction of this new method with the methods that exist already and then um, you don't so and then you could flag it immediately even before being so it put on the market let's say so or you could immediately say i can somehow the the industry could coordinate between themselves to to um, solve such problems well uh, i stopped the sharing so that i can actually look directly at you uh, while talking well uh, but you the one thing that i disagree with in what you said is we can assess google's interaction with all the other services that we cannot do because users don't just have uh, facebook google and amazon as their service providers they they have little providers bigger providers they have you know locally different things that we cannot take into consideration um and we that we cannot do it's uh yeah not everybody's using industry standards for for their um uh for their security services not everybody is not every provider is living up to what, what they need to um I, I agree with you that yes, we cannot leave it to the user to assign security scores. This this would have to be uh, um, uh, in in some sense done for them. They would have to be educated. Uh, they can very well express though their uh, their priorities. They know which of the accounts they consider important. Where is their valuable da data? Uh, which ones are less important? So those aspects they can give. Uh, yeah, and from those they can also tell us what they're what they're concerned about uh you know are, do they trust their uh, uh um their roommates do they you know do they worry about internet attacks or not we can take these things into account in a scoring scheme I think from a practical perspective like as soon as we start yeah maybe i don't know just uh, just use some machine learning or something because because uh, yeah, I don't see it like the user be saying like this suddenly starting saying important score and even about friends. But I think yeah, ideally is like just something in the background which could just uh, I'm creating things and then it will infer uh, vulnerabilities. I mean something really purely automatic, like with really no interaction, zero zero interaction. Because I think. As, as soon as we start saying, I want to manage, like even the password manager is there. I don't know how many people use password managers. I mean, because they are built in the browser, right? So that's why we are using because it, it's built into the browser, so. Yes, yes. I mean, clearly, yes. The, the adoption of something like this is is highly questionable at the moment. The, the yes, the, the feasibility, all of this seems challenging, um, but we do need something better than password managers because our systems are complex uh one of the slides that i didn't show uh showed i don't know overleaf with single sign on you know this was going to be a great solution one password for you know all of your other accounts and you go to say overleaf and you have five different uh possible identity providers well i don't remember which one of them i chose because overleaf does not have the same identity providers as i don't know gitlab uh, so if I chose one that one has, but not the other, well, now, you know, which one did I use where? So, you know, it, we have many accounts, uh, we have complex relationships, we need something that, that helps us manage this. Um, uh, it, it's not going to get, you know, better, we will only get more of those accounts. Right. <laughs> Any other questions? We are already half past. <laughs> yeah. So.
So I guess with this modeling, the credit card number and data and everything, so do you plan to introduce some notion of data or a state inside this and state manipulation? Because I, and this is connected to, I was wondering like if a tool like classic tool like Proverif or Tamarin could be used to model these things because actually to me, it even looks more natural to do it in Tamarin than to do it in this account graph because it's like you don't need colors and you don't need, you just put the rules, access rules, there's a transition and... Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I, I don't know, as you know, or may not know, I I come from the security protocol community. So so, for a long time, this was my my most natural approach to 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 this type of question. It was like, well, so you know, how do we formulate a protocol around all of the things that we're doing? You know, how do we consider this as a distributed system where a lot of things happen and find issues with it? Um, and yes, we can consider this as a, as a dynamical system with with states and and figure things out maybe there's some value in it um but i was i was trying deliberately not to go there with these account graphs um because what we what we want is sort of the the current moment of my accounts and you know what are the issues with it right now this is what i essentially want to analyze um and it, it seems i can get a lot of work done with it um as you noticed with the um, uh with the attack on amazon yes not everything can be represented the fact that an attacker could change something yes it, it cannot be represented but there is a trade-off between is it worth complicating this formalism and then losing an understanding of what it actually tries to represent is that worth it for the extra attacks that we that we may capture that way it's yeah I, I don't of course have the answer right now we will be playing with such extensions but um yeah if if they if they seem natural as an extension then yes it would be very interesting to to have them okay so maybe we should stop here and if you have more questions you want to discuss with Sasha, you know he's uh, at the University of Surrey and then you can send him an email and then uh, discuss offline. Okay, yeah. let's thank Sasa again for this excellent talk. Yeah. Thanks everybody for sticking around so long. Yeah. Yeah, very nice, thank you. Okay, thank you everyone and uh, now we conclude this session. Mm -hmm.